since most people probably listening to this, watching this, whatever, aren't familiar with it, um, Pennsylvania's a different setup when it comes to wine and spirits than, well, 49 or 48 other states. We have a state system, and at least up until fairly recently, you could not buy any spirits or any wine without going to the state store. They loosened things up a little bit a few years ago, so in-state distillers and wineries can sell direct, and then they allowed began allowing some some restaurants and bars to get a wine license. So and that wine license has allowed you to sell wine to go out of your locations. As a restaurateur, you still have to go to the state stores to pick up your wine and many and your spirits in many cases. It's a nightmare. Um Pennsylvania, I mean if there's any good that can come out of some of the issues with shutting down the state stores and stuff uh, at the beginning, uh, you know, I really hope that it's Pennsylvanians can realize what a terrible state they live in uh, for alcohol. Um, the PLCB is, is an absurd organization. It's an absurd approach to liquor. So, you know, Kevin, you obviously um, just touched on this, but Pennsylvania is a state monopoly when it comes to uh, wine and spirits. Um, we can buy what's called special orders, SLOs, special limited orders, but we still have to buy them through the state. So that means a couple things for you, the consumer out there. Um, it means that um, we can't make deals volume because it has to cost the same to everyone. So if I buy 500 cases of Appleton a year, which we do, um, we pay the same amount for case number 500 of Appleton um, as you do at the liquor store with a 10% licensee discount. That means that for us, if we sell 500 cases of Appleton, uh, the cocktail is going to have to cost the same as if we were making for it for you at home. So if you go to Three Dots and a Dash in uh, Chicago, they can make a deal with Appleton and they can say, hey, if we go through 500 cases, uh, can we pay, you know, 50 cents on the dollar? And Appleton will say yes. Pennsylvania's monopoly is essentially forcing bars and restaurants to pay, uh, you know, in some cases twice as much as they would um, as their competitors, well, not competitors, but as bars and restaurants in other states. With yeah. wine, with special order spirits, we go through the pleasure of placing our order for that uh, SLO. This is the way it would work. You have a distributor who brings it into the state, whether it's wine or a spirit. And if we go to the distributor and say, hey, we would like to buy a case of California Cabernet Sauvignon that we like or whatever, um, will you list it in Pennsylvania? Then we place an order, which means that they add it into um, a system called Loop, which is about as badly run of a computer uh, like software uh, system website uh, as you can imagine. So they list it in Loop. And then we go in and we approve for it and we have to pay the state when we approve it. Because remember, we're not buying this from the distributor. We're buying it from the state. So we pay and then the distributor ships that wine to the state store and we go and we pick it up from the state store. Now, there's a number of things that practically happen. Um, first of all, distributors fuck shit up all the time. So you go in and you've got your wrong order. Well, now. I've already paid the state, so fixing it becomes incredibly complicated by two people who have to go through a common entity. And you say, well, isn't there some value? Don't they at least check the order? No, they're actually not allowed to open the cases. They can't even look to see that the order is what it said it was. They offer literally zero value other, in, other than being a place that essentially holds your spirits that you've already paid for until you go to pick them up. Like, to be clear, I'm not some sort of like anti-government libertarian here. I just think monopolies are bad no matter who has them. Um, you when when the state just can do whatever and offer the absolute bare minimum of services with the absolute worst support possible, there's no incentive for them to change. They're going to make their money one way or the other. And that's one of the things that I think is so absurd that 
our licensees, uh, like restaurants can't sell and couldn't sell prior to this um, uh, cocktails to go or spirits to go, which is at the end of the day, we still have to buy it from the state. They're still making their money. And, you know, to say that, well, you know, we don't want we don't want restaurants selling spirits because they'll sell them to minors and stuff like that. That's all bullshit. I mean, it's it's not a real reason, because like if you've ever gone to your PLCB store, like there's nobody there is exactly like a rocket scientist. There's no reason that bars and restaurants can't follow the same rules that state employees do. We have to get our people trained anyways um, to be able to sell wine through, you know, what's called responsible alcohol management protocols, um, ramp certifications. So like, there's really nothing there. It's just this archaic system. And, you know, it's constantly threatening to bring prohibition back in some way, shape or form. And the irony to at least the pricing is that Pennsylvania is up there on the largest customers for virtually every liquor manufacturer available. Right. But in other freer markets, for lack of a better term, that would give them buying power, which in theory should bring our price down. Yet I can, cr- if I want to, I can cross the border into Delaware or into New Jersey and pay less for my bottle of Jack Daniels, for my bottle of you know, Bacardi's, for these big brands that should be cheaper. And, you know, we're paying significantly more. Yep. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. <laughs> the COVID thing, which was just... I don't want to say ridiculous, but, you know, as a result of Governor Wolf shutting the state down, all of the state-run liquor stores were shut down as well. I'm not going to argue with shutting the stores down, but the, the unintended consequence for that was that any bar or store that was selling wine or spirits doesn't have access to it anymore because you cannot get the stuff delivered to you. We had like $6,000 worth of product sitting at the store for three months um, that we had paid for. And we weren't even allowed to sell the spirits that we had. So you created this situation where like every restaurant in town is like, just let me sell my hooch, man. Like, please, we need something like let us sell. We have chairman's uh, select, uh, you know, private cask, Hidden Harbor rum. We would love to sell that. And we still can't. And at the time, at the shutdown, you had people who were doing things that, like, if your COVID policy is to try to keep people from doing stupid shit like traveling, then you better let them get some fucking local booze in them because they're going to go to other states. It's literally creating the exact problem you're trying to to prevent, Um, you know, and it would have been such a simple fix. And it's amazing. It took the state something like a month and a half, a month, something to start doing a curbside pickup program. Every restaurant in town start figured that out in days. I mean, and why would you want to send everyone to one location when you can spread people out and send them across, you know, they can stay in their own neighborhood. They don't have to get in the car. Like there were all of these bad decisions that were made oh, yeah. because of the PLCB. And the fact is, is that the PLCB, it has a huge, huge co- collective bargaining, bargaining unit. And they are worried that their jobs will be obsolete if we let restaurants and bars sell things. Now, that is, of course, ridiculous because, like, we would need to hire people, too, you know. And if you're so good at your goddamn job, wouldn't you be the first hireable person? You know, you have Democrats who are scared of the the union and you have Republicans who are scared of a loss of tax uh, revenue. And you also have Republicans who have antiquated uh, concepts of the way that bars and restaurants work Um, and think that, you know, if you let us sell spirits to go, uh, the next thing is that every child on the block will be shooting up heroin. (laughs) <laughs> guys, I mean, it's it's so bad and it's so entrenched because both parties are, are no one wants to touch it politically. Um, and it, and it's it if if Pennsylvanians realized how bad they're getting screwed because of the BLCB, uh, it would be gone tomorrow. Um, it's like every every bar owner, restaurant owner, every spirits writer, everyone has a moral obligation to explain to the people of Pennsylvania how bad this system is for them and their wallets. Indoor dining was shut down, um, but slowly we've been allowed to reopen across the state and most of the country. But your three places, 
you've remained closed and you've been vocal about why you're remaining closed. The jury is very, very much in on indoor dining and it's um, it's one of the riskiest behaviors for transmission of coronavirus. It poses a number of problems that you can't solve. What do we have as far as defenses of, against coronavirus? Let's actually start even before then, which is how does this spread? And the reality is, is that despite the WHO's resistance, initial resistance to this, it's an airborne virus. It's not just bro- it's not just droplets that, you know, I'm spitting onto this computer screen when I talk that if you're, you know, within six feet of me, you, you might get uh, hit on. It, it aerosolizes. It goes on smaller droplets. Um, and there is uh, an abundance of evidence that very concretely shows that that's the case, that somebody who's sitting over there 20 feet away from me, if they're in my air conditioning line, they can get sick. And you've got examples of one person infecting 12 people in a restaurant in like five minutes. I mean, we're not talking, oh, it was hours and hours. One of the things that I think is important to realize is that this is not saying that we can't do anything indoors. Like we've we found out relatively quickly that retail environments, people going into big box stores and things like that, um, we can do. And I think there's a number of reasons for that. First of all, it's easier to ventilate a lot of those environments. Two, you can put your mask on. And what no one initially thought was, well, no one in this country initially thought uh, was going to be a prophylactic measure of masking. It turns out that prophylactic measure. Wearing a mask works, but when you're eating, you can't wear a fucking mask. Uh, Or when you're drinking, you can't wear a mask. The best thing you can do is in between sips and bites, and people just don't do that. Um, that, That's just not the way it works. Oh, you also, it's hard to ventilate a restaurant. People don't want to sit next to an open door um, or open windows all the time. We very quickly realized that if we're going to be responsible, we can't just open up because we're allowed to. Um, And I wish that, you know, I think there were a number of ways, again, I don't want to turn this into like a government rant type thing, but there are a number of different situations for reopening that the government could have pushed. I would have liked to see us really focusing on outdoor stuff. Um, governments should have made, and in some cases they did in Pittsburgh, we have, you know, parking uh, place permits. A lot of major cities have done that, but I think, you know, you would have had this kind of push to have more outside festivals, even things like that. I don't think, I don't think it's the same level of risk. You don't have that same potential for a super spreader event when things are outdoors. You have to worry about bathrooms and stuff like that. If people have to go inside, you can have choke points or lines or whatever. But we saw all these photographs early on of people at Lake of the Ozarks or uh, people in New York uh, sitting at parks and everyone was up in arms. But the reality is, is that those were not the events that spread this. It was people going to restaurants. It was sitting inside at houses, stuff like that. Um, So uh, and obviously, you know, any sort of indoor, you know, nursing homes, things like that with with common ventilation. So, you know, I think it's irresponsible to open up dining rooms. I understand the temptation. We're all hurt and bad. And I also understand that not everyone has the same ability to successfully pivot into takeout as we did or um, to, to, to use outdoor dining. But I think that you could have focused relief on those folks. Um uh, and, um, we will someday be back, but it became clear, like, you know, when, uh, we got to the point of even July ish, it started to become clear we were going to get a good vaccine. I don't think we knew it was going to be this good. So we kind of looked at it as like, Hey, look, we can suffer through this for a year until we have a vaccine. Um, but then once we have a vaccine, we're going to be able to, to reopen and do it safely. So it's just a year. What the fuck? Let's get through it. And that's really been our approach. Um, and, you know, I'm watching vaccination efforts, obviously, incredibly closely. And I don't think we will reopen indoor dining until our whole staff has the vaccine. I think that's probably the right thing to do is I don't want anyone to have to come to work risking getting sick. So. When everyone's vaccinated, I think, you know, we'll probably be open up to, to open indoor dining again. Public health shouldn't be a political debate. You know, it should be we need to do something to help the public. <laughs> debate, debate is over. Let's do it. But needless to say, it was. 
and just, well, hell, the very existence of the pandemic was up for political debate, which is, you know, absurd. You had been very vocal about, well, your dislike for the way the previous administration handled it. And, uh, you know, obviously the jury's still going to be out on the Biden administration because, well, we're still in the midst of it, but at least things seem to be moving in the right direction. Yeah. But uh, you were on, I think, Dancing Gnome's uh, podcast during the summer, and, you know, you you definitely took some shots at the Republicans, you know, about how they basically weren't taking care of people. <laughs> you know, they're... That, that you know you can't do handouts you can't do this you can't do that but the, but you didn't let the Democrats off the hook because in many cases at least on the left you know the blanket is just throw money at people and help them and neither of those really is the best thing right but you you brought up something that I'd been popping around in the back of my head which was the Roosevelt administration and things like the WPA as somebody who's incredibly liberal I don't like the idea that the liberal solution to something is to say, this is a free ride, you know, and, and, and I'm not saying we need obviously unemployment benefits. That's for sure. I'm not arguing that point, but if you're going to spend money, I think the better way of doing it was again, exactly what the Roosevelt administration did, which is, yeah, we are going to take care of you, but you have to come in and work. Um, and you know, I think that's what the economy needs Um, if you're going to give somebody like, you know, one of the other, the flip side of that coin, I think is one other, you know, uh, no one listens to Pete, but Pete says it anyways, kind of, um, approach that I think would have been smart, uh, would have been at the beginning of this thing. Uh, if you're going to give pandemic checks, if you're going to give everyone $1,400, what I think would have made more sense is to, as opposed to like throwing out, hey, we're going to shut down tomorrow. I think it would have made sense. And I think you could have really nipped this thing in the bud had you said, we're going to be shutting down in two weeks. Get wherever the hell you need to go to be for 14 days of full and complete quarantine. Here is $5,000 for your being unable to do anything other than stay in your house for 14 days. And we're going to enforce this. And it's going to be, we're going to, you know, obviously we have federalism issues. Um, so we we essentially bribe states to do that by saying we're conditioning, you know, your highway, your transportation funding, blah, 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 over that. To take that money, you're going to have to institute this two-week shutdown. And again, we're going to fund your people to do this. That would have been the hard shutdown, I think, that we actually needed to get cases down to near zero. Um, and then you can actually combat this thing with travel restrictions and stuff like that, that we ultimately have done on both. I mean, the Biden administration is shutting down travel as well based on variants. So, you know, I think I think my issue is if you're going to give away money to the general public, you need to get something back. And I don't think that's too much to ask. I don't think that's a conservative position. I think that's I don't know. I hate that somehow liberalism at some point in time, it used to be about we're trying to create jobs for people because jobs give people value. They give people self-worth. We're trying to keep people employed, not we're trying to keep people unemployed. Um, And that I think is the way that I've seen a lot of direction from the left in the various stimulus packages is um, we're creating somewhat perverse incentives for people to stay home. You know, meanwhile, you know, you've got the, you know, the, Conservatives are generally considered, quote unquote, fiscally responsible, but they don't want to give money to people at all. They want to give it to companies. And while, yes, that on face value, yeah, trickle down, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It, that doesn't work either. It doesn't work. And, we know it doesn't work. I mean, if I had to choose between those two realms, obviously I'd go with the way the, <laughs> the, the more liberal way, which was, you know, give to the people as opposed to give to companies but you know that that we're not working in a black and white world i love the the, you know when you threw out the wpa in that conversation i just thought it was brilliant because if you were an unskilled laborer they could find they found work for you right if you were a brilliant musician or artist 
they found work for you. If you were an engineer, they found work for you. I mean, it was fantastic. And the United States still is benefiting from some of the things that they did in the 1930s. Short of the 1950s and some of the stuff that Eisenhower put in, that was the last great time that, you know, the U.S. put stuff in was when they did that. You know, there is, uh, I think, a uniformly felt, uh, uh, at least among experts, need for um, uh, to, to revisit our infrastructure in the country. I mean, things like the power grid are the perfect example, right? I mean, like we just saw Texas get laid bare. Um, uh, we have terribly inefficient power grids. You know, that's easy investment and that creates jobs all around. I mean, that creates as many unskilled positions, if not more unskilled positions that it does skilled. Um, so, you know, there are these projects that we've been putting off as a country for a long time. Um, and I just I feel like when you're talking about literally trillions of dollars of stimulus, um, this was the time to start biting those things off. And I worry that uh, uh, our failure to do so and taking somewhat of a panicked approach, um, you know, the PPP, again, we got it. And I don't want to complain about, you know, essentially money that we got to subsidize our payroll. But um, it was rushed. No one knew the rules. The rules kept changing. Um, and, you know, at some point, I think what we we exposed how bad we are at governing in this country at the moment. And that is it's yes, Trump. I, I mean, as I said to anyone who would listen to me, I whether you're incredibly liberal um, or moderate or even super conservative, but not absolutely fucking crazy. Um, the choice between Biden and Trump was the choice of would you like a government or would you not like a government? Because that was truly the choice. And you're seeing, you know, we talked a little bit how the Biden administration is doing so far. I mean, the jury is obviously still out. But what I can tell you is just looking at the first several months, he's doing the obvious, the low hanging fruit approaches to certain things like what do you. Wait, we weren't using FEMA to distribute vaccines? Are you fucking crazy? What do we have a federal emergency management agency for if it's not right now? Um, you know, putting uh, the the Defense uh, Production Act into play. I mean, these were, I think, low hanging fruit, obvious plays to anyone who wanted to govern. Um, and I think at the end of the day, the Trump administration was, I mean, part of its stated goals was to destroy government. It was to remove, you know, the quote unquote drain the swamp was code for let's just gut government agencies. Um, and, you know, uh, so I think it's good. We're the new administration, whether it hits it out of the park or not, at least is going to hit a single, which is better than not stepping up to the plate at all. No one wants to to Monday morning quarterback this because it's hard. And by the way, good country, even countries that handled things well initially, like Germany, they got crushed in the fall and the, the winter. Yeah. You know, I mean, it has been a challenge for every government. Um, now, there are places like Australia that are just crushing it. And New, yeah, New Zealand, even more so. Yeah. And and, you know, um but one of the most unforgivable sins, I think, of the Trump administration, um, and one of the things that I think this all looks different, is that at the end of the day, there was a power vacuum in the world that America is used to filling, both for good and for ill, that handles this type of shit relatively well by getting on the phone with world leaders and yeah. applying the right pressure. And when we saw it just spread like crazy, I don't know. It's hard. It's difficult to say. And I don't think I can necessarily conclude this doesn't leave China if Trump isn't president. I, I don't think that's fair. But yeah, I, I do don't think, think so either. I do think that a strong WHO with America playing a strong, a strong NATO, like if America is strongly in all of its alliances, um, I think that we have a fighting chance of making sure that we have 
a quarter of the deaths that we had uh, to this point by taking some obvious, easy steps to shut down certain travel to, I mean, even things with like cruise ships. I mean, <laughs> we know they're all infected and you just let them into the fucking port. Like, come on, man. Like we had cruise ships that were just kind of out there. Uh, and, you know, it, there was there were some real just complete unforgivable sins that yeah. really started this getting out of control very quickly. I, I mean, I think the biggest one to me is will always be the fact that they, you know, jammed their fingers in their ear and pretended this wasn't happening. And that's, and still, and, you know, and basically have conditioned a certain portion of the country to believe it still. Right. Um, even yeah. relatively intelligent people. Um, it's mind blowing. You know, the fact that the United States, you know, and I, I'm not going to probably put this in because I'm not sure of the numbers, but I mean, per capita, we have a higher death toll than a country like India. And I'm not knocking it, I'm not knocking India, but just the sheer concentration of people in that country. Absolutely. India Shouldn't. did a nationwide shutdown, though, and and India was getting out of control, and they actually shut it down hard and nationwide. And and again, you've got issues that are long, the long, long, long more uh, or far, far, far more structural than who is president, which are American civil liberties and things of that nature, which yes. you know are balancing act at times like this. But um, but that said, India did a good shutdown, and it it saved their ass. I mean, and we never had that in the United States. And instead, what we did was we made it political and gave license to governors like Texas. Like, what the fuck? 